Hey everybody, Chris here. Hello. Blythe again. Blythe there. Now it's new wardrobe. New wardrobe. <laughs> well, this is the first time they're seeing the video, so. Oh shoot. Well, okay. So there, there's You'll a little bit. You might notice A little bit of time travel going now. on. Yeah. Um, so we originally recorded this video, uh, and it went fantastically. And then the files got corrupted because of, mostly because of my carelessness. <laughs> and so, uh, so we had to re-record some of this. So this is us re-recording the video that was originally recorded, which is, I know, a lot of layers of the onion for, for this. But, um, but this is a really cool ac activity, which we're excited to tell you about. Uh, it's called the Particle Accelerator. I don't have any particle physics necessary <laughs> experience so much. Uh, Blind here, what's your background? I know you can shoot particles at biological samples, but like with taking x-rays, you can also use them to probe different uh, molecules, but yes. not, I'm not in front of a particle accelerator. <laughs> yeah, so, so, we are, so we are not necessarily the experts when it comes to uh, subatomic particles and all that. But we're going to do the best we can and uh, there's a fun activity here to, to talk about uh, with you guys. So um, so this is the, the page we got, so there's probably a link in the bottom of the screen there. So should we switch real quick and, and sure. kind of open up the code here? Yeah. Um, so I don't know, should we, should we show them what happens before we before we open up the code. Yeah. So just to kind of give you the, the Cliff Notes version of what's about to happen. And by the way, this, this activity works better with Chrome for some reason, but there we go. So we got a particle that was accelerated between two plates and it has a, it's gonna have some final velocity that we can measure. So there you go. And so that's the basic idea of it, and we're going to try to see how does this depend on the charge, how does this depend on the mass, uh, and can we accurately predict what this velocity is. Um, but the first thing to do is to open up the code and just sort of, uh, uh, Blythe is going to look through the code and we're going to see what looks familiar and what looks different. And then we're actually going to run the code and think about what the results are. I just realized x-rays are photons. They aren't accelerated. X-rays are photons, <laughs> so. But there are proton therapies for yes. cancer, for instance. And Actually, they, yeah. some of the research that I do uh, is trying to use lasers to accelerate the protons to do cancer right, therapy. To, for a particular depth or something like that, right? Right, so the, the, more the problem with accelerating protons for, for cancer therapy is that if you're gonna use something like what you just saw, uh, it's gonna take this really long thing because there's only so there's only so large of an electric field that we can make in a lab, mm -hmm. uh, but lasers uh, can potentially have much larger electric fields, and so we can try to take advantage of that. But this is the simple way of accelerating particles, um, and so if you want to open up the code, we can take yeah. a look at that. So I'm just gonna close this, make this bigger. So we have some variables that set, variables that set up the, um, param the initial parameters of our particle. So x, y, v, x, v, y, our initial velocity. We have the mass of a particle here in this very convenient atomic mass unit. So that we can use to represent, you know, one proton or one, yeah, one proton essentially. So a neutron would be two. Then we have these variables that describe the placement of our capacitor plates. So here they're at 200 and 500s, they have a separation of 300. And then this little Q here, that's the charge of our incoming particle. And the big E is the strength of that magnetic, of that electric field. Got to remember it's electric field, not magnetic. And then here, as we're um, updating the velocity and the position of our particle, 
we can enter this clause here where we have this non-zero, we can have a non-zero delta vx when we're in between these two, when, in between the two plates. So when the position is beyond the left plate and before the right plate, we can have this acceleration and therefore this change in our velocity. And then we update, or in the next time step we update the velocity of that particle, but here we just we draw what um, what was previously calculated. Okay. So that's like the general layout. Mm -hmm. uh, so just one thing I want to point out is this time variable here, right there. You see that? So this is t plus equals delta t, and so at the beginning of the program you'll see it says t equals zero. So at the very beginning the zero time has elapsed, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but then every time that we run the draw function, we run the draw function 60 times a second, uh, uh, we're going to increment this time, uh, and so it gets larger and larger. But only if what? Only if we enter this conditional statement, which is when the particle is in between the plates. So we're measuring the time that the particle is experiencing the electric field. Right, and so there's, an, there's a... This is sort of an ampersand symbol. Do you remember? Is that an and or an or? That's an and. So we want both of those statements on either end to be true. Right. So if x is greater than x plate left, okay. So if there's a plate that's over, sorry, here, uh, if it's greater than, if the x position is greater than uh, that that plate, then that's true. But then there's a plate over. Sorry, there's a plate. <laughs> over, yeah, so if the, I don't know which hand is wiggling which finger anymore <laughs> watching the screen. This is your point. <laughs> um, okay. Should I bring up the picture? <laughs> yeah, let's bring up the picture here. Okay, so if x is greater than x plate left and x is less than x plate right, then, then this uh, you you use this, and you have you're changing the velocity. Okay. So then you're accelerating. So again, only when the particle is in between those two plates is basically what this works out to. But it's if this is true and that is true. Um, so does this does this time get uh, increased uh, all the time? Or is it only when is it only when something special happens? So is that keeping track of how much time has happened from the start of the simulation, or is it keeping track of something else? It's keeping track of how long the particles in between the two plates. Right, because if 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 the if statement isn't true, yeah. then this code doesn't get run, and so this statement is only true. Uh, when the particle sort of reaches this inlet. And by the way, in real life what this is, is you have two big pieces of metal that are charged up. Um, and so if they're charged up and then there's an electric field between the two of them, we made this tiny little, there's a tiny little hole in between for the particle to go through. Um, pop quiz, which one is the positive, positively charged plate, which one's the negatively charged plate? So is it is it this one that's positively charged, or is this one negatively charged? What do you think? So I think of you're looking at like what a proton sees. It sees field lights coming from positive charged yes. plates. Mm -hmm. So this would be the positive plate. Yep. This would be the negative one. That's right. The field lines always go from positive to negative. No exceptions. Okay. Yep. So, uh, so that's how the code works. That's what the code is doing. Um, but let's just play it one more time, and uh, and we'll we'll note it, we'll take note of what the final velocity is, but also how much time it, it spent in that in that field. And then we'll have to go hit the numbers and see if we can figure out why it, why why we got the result that we get. So go ahead. Go ahead. Come in, get this 
accelerated. Uh, go ahead and click the screen. I think that sometimes helps it. There you go. So final velocity is 55.5. How much time did it spend in the field? I can't read it myself. 9.1. 9.1. Um, and so what we want to try to do is we want to try to figure out if we can explain this number with that number uh, and all the stuff at the beginning of the program. So, so it was 9.1 seconds in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the charge of the particle? I think just plus one. What was the proton. mass of the particle? Uh, one atomic mass unit. Okay, and then what was the field? Five. Five. Now, so we're, in a second we're going to jump to the glass board. Uh, before we do, it's important to say that the the units of the electric field here are not actually the usual newtons per coulomb units. Um, and that's because uh, I didn't want to put in a whole bunch of factors of 1.6 times 10 to <laughs> negative 19 in here. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that, um, for me, this is simpler to, to do it that way. So the electric field units here, it's five, uh, but instead of being five newtons per coulomb, it's f a newton is uh, kilogram meters per second squared. So instead of kilogram meters per second squared, it's going to be atomic mass units meter per second squared. And then instead of dividing by a coulomb, mm -hmm. we're going to divide by the unit charge. In other words, the charge of the proton. So you might say that this is, you could say that this is the electric field in like a natural unit, which is, I think that's what I have written there. Yeah. Um, and the, a lot of the times when you're running these scientific programs, uh, the units uh, are not necessarily SI units, for example. So I don't know if you encounter this in your research. Do, do they have, what do they have, nanometer units, angstroms or anything? I don't know what you guys use. But yeah, nanometers, microns. Um, our, our usual shortcut is putting energies in terms of kBT, so like a, a room temperature thermal energy. Okay. So, so not everything is an SI units when right. you run your codes. Um, same thing with me. So when I do plasma codes, my plasma codes, the, the units of position is in centimeters uh, and centimeters. And when I used to do cosmological simulations, uh, like the units of those codes are like light years or something like that, <laughs> you know? And which is a lot easier to use if you're, if you're modeling the galaxy, it's a lot easier to use light years as your unit instead of, you know, three times 10 to the 26 or something yeah. meters, uh, you know. So, so this is something that, that happens all the time in scientific code. So if it seems a little weird, that's okay. Uh, but it's a good stepping stone towards uh, just how, how all the different fields of physics use these kinds of things. So let's jump to the glass board and try to figure out where did this, can we explain this 55.5? All right. 